I've heard um, another man, Dr. Frederick Leboye, you may be familiar with his work, uh, he's told me that uh, that he's seen people who've actually gotten rid of the the ego in that sense and it's been a disastrous thing. Do you have any, uh, like, what I'm really looking for is errors that can be made uh, in traveling the, the path and trying to get rid of the ego. Are you familiar with that and how is that disastrous? Uh, I've never met anybody who's really gotten rid of the ego. There are certainly all kinds of traps on the path. We can go into that if you want to. Let's do then. Um, Bef before we go into that, I just before we leave essence and persona, one of the things you mentioned was that essence tends to come to the forefront in a rural society, rural area, and persona is more predominant in city and urban areas. And this would imply essence being the real um, center of things, that um, we should close down our cities, that people should move from the cities into country life. And um, and also I want to relate this to the fact that back in, this, in the late 60s there was a dropout factor, that there was a heavy movement to back the land. It's still there, but there's also a movement to dropping back in, that people seem to be coming back from the retreat areas and moving back into life in the world. And I just wanted to have you uh, comment on that with respect to persona in essence. Well, the balanced man, the balanced person, has to maintain both essence and persona, has to be able to function in both environments, in both the city environment and the rural environment. This is the ideal. If you can only function effectively uh, living in a cave somewhere in the Himalayas, then you're not a balanced individual. And yet there are certain uh, people who shouldn't deal with other people. You mentioned the problems a cerebratonic type would have uh, dealing with the strong mesomorph in his uh, uh, approach to life and it, it cerebratonic needs to be off by himself uh, more he's more creative when he's uh, not so involved or surrounded by others yes in, the, in his undeveloped form he needs a lot of solitude but he can reach the point of development where he can create that solitude even when he's among a lot of people a fully developed individual is able to create an inner sanctuary under almost any conditions. There's a Tibetan saying, by skillful means you can be comfortable even in hell. <laughs> what have the pitfalls been along the way uh, in your traveling the path of the master game? What ones are you familiar with? Well, there are several of them, of course, and one of the first is the fact that uh, people who are predominant, predominantly in persona, think and talk about the inner work instead of doing it. Then they get hooked on the guru. That's another very, very common one. They get stuck on the guru. Whatever the guru says, they'll do. If he tells them to throw themselves over a cliff, they probably do it. They completely lose discrimination. They become... Uh, totally uh, without inner strength. They just rely on their teacher. Then the teacher himself can fall into the trap of thinking that he's a big shot and false messiah syndrome. That, that develops very commonly. And then the most subtle one of them all is the personal salvation syndrome. Now, it's a very peculiar thing that you have to play the master game very lightly. If you get over-identified with the idea of becoming a master, you'll stop at that point. You'll get stuck. You can develop power through the ma playing the master game. You can develop power. And you can get stuck on the mountain of power because there are two mountains, the mountain of power and the mountain of liberation. And you can get stuck on that mountain of power, so that you're really a very powerful person. And you can influence people, because people in general are so weak, 
You can influence them. You can draw large numbers of them after you. You can take millions of their precious dollars and have a thorough big power trip which you get stuck there. Wow. Dr. Durap, you were talking about power trips, and one of the things that, that certainly is manifested uh, in our society in, in this time is the power trip uh, with an emphasis on money. And perhaps we can talk about the, uh, that a little bit, because uh, in Western culture, especially in America, um, anything new comes along, like the, the spiritual path and uh, such things as that. Now, money has been tied to that, and so... Um, for two weekends, uh, we'll give you instant enlightenment. Uh, we'll show you the way. Uh, how do you see that? Yes, unfortunately, it's uh, um, the world's oldest con game. For such and such a sum, we will pilot your soul through the after-death world. We will make sure that you get into heaven. We will make sure that you get higher consciousness uh, just a little bit more we haven't quite made it yet uh, a few more dollars or whatever it's the world's oldest con game and uh, suckers fall for it all the time and there's an enormous crop of suckers in our present uh, culture so you can do very nicely out of them but unfortunately this has absolutely nothing to do with the master game absolutely nothing to do with it you cannot charge money if you are in fact a guide on the way, a genuine one, you aren't even interested in whether people have money or not. It's got nothing to do with it. There are very, very few people who can actually tread the path. Most of them will drop out. And the only thing a real master is concerned with is finding those few people. And he may have to work with hundreds or even thousands of people in order to find a little tiny handful who can actually get somewhere. He is not interested in money. For heaven's sakes, he's grown out of that hog in the trough game long ago. Well, it's been said, and especially with some of these people saying that, because this question comes up quite a bit, why do you charge so much uh, with something that uh, renders uh, value uh, to uh, humanity, so to speak. And the response, the common response, the consensus response, seems to be that um, because of being raised in this society and the conditioning is such that we, we have learned to equate money with value. And if it's not, uh, if it doesn't cost money, then we're not going to get anything out of it. And um, if it's free, then you're not going to do anything with it. Uh, maybe you can comment on that. Well, you have to <clears throat> admit that there's something in that point of view, yes. Some people do only value the uh, teachings which they've paid for. The question is, what does the teacher do with the money? If he wants it for himself, then he's definitely got stuck on a power trip and is just playing hog in the trough in a rather more advanced style than it's usually played. If he himself is completely indifferent to money, but just realizes that in certain cases these people have got to be made to pay because they worship money and that's all they, they value, and they won't value the teaching unless they have to pay for it. If he's at, at that level, that's quite a different game. After all, you remember the classic case of the rich young man who, who came to Jesus and wanted to follow his uh, way. And Jesus said to him, sell all that you have. But he did not say, give it to me. He said, sell all that you have and give to the poor and take up your cross and follow me. And he could not do so. And Jesus said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom. It is easier for a camel to pass through a needle's eye, which is absolutely true. You're uh, saying that uh, the path is a very narrow one and only a few people really could seriously be on it. Uh, it cuts out uh, a whole spectrum of uh, spiritual questing and a whole population in California and elsewhere that's uh, into this. Do you see them as just being part-timers who really won't uh, continue? 
Oh, they play a game which is uh, probably based on talking and thinking. The talk-think syndrome is one of the biggest traps of all. So they get together and they hold seminars and they trot around to lectures and they uh, exchange views and they read a lot of books and... Do radio programs. Do radio programs and uh, so it goes. It's got nothing to do with development. It would seem that... Um well, you did say in your book that it's better not to embark upon the game at all than to play it half-heartedly. You run the risk of destroying your potential by embarking half-heartedly. That is true. It is possible for a person to begin to play the game and partially awaken, and then stop playing the game and go to sleep again. And this state is called second sleep. And it's recognized that second sleep is much worse than first sleep. It's much more difficult to wake up from second sleep than from first sleep. In fact, Uspensky used to say that in the Lord's Prayer, where it says, deliver us from evil, it should be translated as deliver us from the evil. And that the evil actually is second sleep. Is this would be, this second sleep would equate with someone being turned on, getting... Um, say, getting into one's essence and experiencing something beyond what someone has experienced before and then falling back into the persona? They lose their way for one reason or another. They lose their aim. They no longer remember what they were looking for. I've seen it happen again and again. A person begins. Now, the beginning is always accompanied by an upsurge of energy, a force. We call it the first note of the octave of development, which is very powerful. And this carries them forward until they encounter the first, what we call, interval. The first interval is the point where they run out of that initial energy. And then they lose that initial force. In the religious language, this is called a period of dryness. They no longer have it. This invariably happens. You cannot avoid it. It doesn't mean they go to sleep again. They just don't have that initial force. Then by some means or other, probably being helped by the teacher or being helped by the other students in the group, they get over that and then they go on. But in some cases, they fall out. They lose their way. Hesse described this very, very clearly in, in the journey to the East, a man who lost his way. He lost contact with the League. He, by great difficulty, managed to find it again. It is possible to find it again, certainly, but it is very much more difficult. So it is always said, it's better not to start at all than to start and then drop out. They say once you've been, they also said that once you, once you have experienced this kind of thing, there's no way that you can get away from it. There's no way. Well, what I'm telling you about only applies to people who've gone a certain distance, I mean really gone a certain distance, not just talked and thought about the work, but actually begun to change. You have to realize that this teaching is based on alchemy. Alchemy teaches that man can transform certain chemical substances in himself. And by those transformations, he can begin to, so to speak, fuel the higher machines which are present in his totality. They call for this special fuel. He actually changes chemically, or alchemically, if you like. Now, once that change has begun, then it is necessary to go on. If it hasn't begun, it doesn't make any difference, you see. The, the person is just a mixture. Gurdjieff used a very interesting analogy to describe this. He said that if you mix certain powders, like, for instance, iron filings and sulfur in chemistry, you can mix them together as long as you like, and you can still separate them from biomechanical means. But if you heat those two together, at a certain point they will fuse and form something totally different. And that cannot be separated any longer. It's totally different. It's changed. And so with man, at a certain point, through inner work, he changes chemically. 
And if such a person then abandons the work, then he is truly in a very bad position. Dr. Durant, this is a very critical viewpoint for so many people who are getting into these paths with the uh, expectation of changing their, uh, um, if nothing else, the traumas that they brought from childhood as a initiation, as a reason for getting into the path. Certainly that causes some of this chemical change you're talking about. Then at that point the person is indeed on the path and your prospectus is that um, most of them are in for worse than they uh, had before they began because they're going to fail. They're not going to continue. Well, you definitely take a risk, but the uh, chemical setup of man is such that he is pretty well protected. Ordinarily, the amount of effort involved in this work simply is not forthcoming. The amount of effort is very great. I'd like to uh, give an example which Gurdjieff was rather fond of. He um, defined four ways, you know, the way of the fakir, the way of the monk, and the way of the yogi, and the fourth way. Now he would describe the way of fakir, which of course is a very elementary way, but it's a fact that there are fakirs in India and they still exist, who undergo this discipline of holding their arms up above their heads. You can say they're complete lunatics if you like, but just try doing it. Try holding your arms up above your heads, not as they do until they wither at the roots and cannot any longer be lowered, but just for 15 minutes and see what a struggle is involved. Now the actual change of the chemistry of the human organism involves a struggle of that order, though not of that order of stupidity. The fakir is a very stupid individual. But he develops physical will in this way. He develops a will which nothing can break. He is an incredibly tough person. And it sometimes happens that yogis get a hold of fakirs and cure their physical defects which they've inflicted upon themselves and teach them to use that tremendous will that they've developed. Because, of course, the trouble with the fakir is he doesn't know how to use the will he's developed. But you can see from this example the sort of effort we're talking about. We have fakirs in America, too. They're known as fakers. No, that's a, a misuse of the word fakir. A fakir is really a devotee who is using or misusing, if you like, the physical body or using pain, physical pain and the struggle with physical pain to develop will. He doesn't know why he why he's doing it, but he does it because he thinks it's pleasing to some god or other or because his teacher has been doing it. For instance, I read a book which was a description of travels in India by a very intelligent woman, quite a, a recent book. And she said that, uh, in Rishikesh, I think, she met a, a teacher who had never sat down for 20 years and never slept. And he had a disciple who said, yes, I'm, I'm going to be uh, up to the level of the Master, I hope, in time. I do sit down occasionally and I sleep for a an hour or so every 24 hours, but I expect to be able to follow in the steps of the Master. Well, she asked him why. Of course, he didn't know. He couldn't explain this because the Master does it. He has to do it. See, this is how fakirs operate. They're not very bright, but they have tremendous strength of will. This brings up the role of suffering in the spiritual quest, and I'm wondering how you see that. Earlier when we were talking about uh, drugs in the mind, you had mentioned that uh, most people don't want to endure discomfort, so they take a pill, uh, so they won't have to. But, like for instance, in Christianity, there's been a big emphasis on suffering as uh, uh, being a way to the truth. And of course, uh, the Buddha said that uh, uh, life is suffering. How do you see that? Well, there's suffering and suffering. On the one hand, it's been said that a person must learn to sacrifice 
suffering. This is a certain kind of suffering which is inflicted on us by the ego. The ego thinks, oh, people don't treat me right, oh, people don't appreciate me, oh, this, oh, that, and the other thing. Now, that's a totally different kind of suffering from the kind of intentional suffering, which is mentioned also as being necessary for following the way. Intentional suffering means struggling with certain inner habits, certain inner tendencies, and above all, struggling with the desire for comfort. We always want to be too comfortable. And in our civilization, we are made so comfortable that we almost literally turn into cabbages. The least little bit of discomfort is strenuously avoided. But actually, through the struggle with discomfort, we develop strength. Now, the fakir, of course, takes this struggle with discomfort to absurd extremes and damages the body. It's not necessary to damage the body. This is ridiculous. But the right kind of struggle with discomfort strengthens the body and strengthens it enormously. Man is a, actually a vehicle which is designed to travel very rough roads. If he hadn't been designed very, very tough, he could never have survived. If you compare man, for instance, with his relatives, the apes, man traveled very rough roads, but the apes, one and all, stayed down in the tropics during the ice ages and never traveled very rough roads. The result is that they're on the way to extinction, whereas man is overgrowing the planet like a cancer. Do you experience there being any higher form in the universe than man? I don't experience it, but I'm sure there is. I'd hate to think that there wasn't. How about, you mentioned earlier, um, Gurdjieff, perhaps not in this life, saw the, um, not in this body, saw the uh, pyramids. That was an allusion to the question of reincarnation. <clears throat> How do you feel about that? Not necessarily reincarnation. It's possible to uh, pick up information from the past, which is not available in the ordinary way. It's possible to know directly the continuity. People who belong to certain archetypes, such as the Magus archetype, they know a great deal, which they could not have learned in this life. For instance, if you read uh, some of the writings of Jung, especially his, his autobiography, you say, yes, Jung was a Magus. He knew certain things. He knew them even as a child. He didn't learn them. He knew them. I think of one of the experiences that uh, Stan Groff um, produced with his experimentation with LSD of one of the recurring experiences on LSD is that experience of the past and of entire civilizations, in fact. Um, is this what you're talking about? Well, uh, something is there in, in the memory, a sort of collective memory, which we aren't able to tap ordinarily. Perhaps it's the collective unconscious of Jung. We know a great deal about the past, but we don't have access to the knowledge. When Hesse wrote his book, Journey to the East, he made a very uh, big deal about the archives, you remember. Now, the archives contain all this information, all this information about past civilizations. And it is possible to make contact with the archives, but only through the higher centers. The ordinary mind cannot get to that material. What do you feel then does happen as a result of death? Where What does occur then after that if you're not recognizing actual reincarnation. You see, death can be a totally different experience for an individual who has developed a soul and an individual who hasn't. If there is no soul, then death is simply the end. The body disintegrates and with it everything goes. If the soul has been developed, then there is a vehicle which can, to some extent, survive death. It's possible that it can reincarnate. I don't know. This is something we cannot answer de definitely. 
if the individual who dies has become completely liberated, then the soul re-blends with the Atman, with the uh, totality. And there is nothing to reincarnate if that person is on the level of Buddha. In your book, you uh, uh, put down the experiences of people like uh, Annie Besant and C.W. Ledbetter, who said that they experienced beings on other planes. Uh, do you still? That was in 1968 in the Master Game. Do you still hold that? Uh, that in fact there are no such beings. That it's a delusion of the mind. Well, Uspensky made a very uh, sound observation about all that theosophical s stuff, all those claims about Akashic records and so forth. He said, yes, sure, they can tell you how things were on the lost continent Atlantis, but they can't tell you where, where you, where you uh, lost a book or something perfectly simple and obvious like that. <laughs> so they do exist, then, the uh, Katumis and Maitreyas, these uh, beings that come through, you do think... This it's absolutely happen. impossible to generalize. One cannot tell what these, what these people were in contact with. There is a certain area in which, if you experiment in, in certain ways, Uspensky described this all in his chapter on experimental mysticism, you enter an area in which it appears as if you're receiving communications. Now he, for instance, got this communication when he was in this state that uh, there were a great. He was thinking about the great temple at Jerusalem, Herod's, temp, Herod's temple, and this voice said to him, "There were a lot of flies there." Well, he thought, of course, there would be a lot of flies because they had blood sacrifices all the time. The place was probably swarming with flies. It was nothing that he couldn't have thought out for himself. Very often, you receive what you think are communications, but in point of fact. They're simply memories. There was a great to-do made over a book called The Search for Bridie Murphy. You may remember about mm. that. It was all just memories, childhood memories. She thought she was picking up a previous incarnation. So you can so easily deceive yourself in this area that really everything in this area has to be treated with the utmost suspicion. Dr. Durop, what is your experience? What is it like for you now as far as your consciousness or your experience of who you are or what it is or life's about, like from moment to moment? Could you put it into any description? Yes, the experience is simply that of the long body of time, the Linga Sharira. This person who's talking now is a cross-section of a process which goes right back to the time of conception and goes right forward to the time of its death. After a certain period in this work, you begin to be aware of the long body, that is to say, of your totality. You are here now. Later on, you'll be further along. Behind you stretches the long body of time. So you no longer sense yourself as being just what you are now, but being all the different people that you were, and also, to some extent, the people you're going to be. And you experience this uh, prospect of your being other people after the physical death at this time? It's possible, but I can't tell for sure. I don't know. In your book, Church of the Earth, you wrote in one of the final chapters about coming into touch with death, that, that this was important to to uh, to know death in order to know life. Perhaps you could expand upon that a little bit here. Definitely there are certain after-death states which can be experienced before death. The three bardos. For instance, the clear light of the void is something which can definitely be experienced before death. The clear light of the void can be entered into by anybody who knows how. I'll admit that it's not very easy to, to know how, but it can be experienced. If you have entered into these after-death states before death, you're not in the least bit worried about death. Why should you? A fully developed 
person can die at will. That is to say, such a person can leave the physical body. Or they can just hold on to it by a very, very slender thread and come back to it. This is well known. It's no big deal. You had mentioned earlier soul development, and you had talked about people dying that have not developed their souls and then just uh, cease to be. Um, this implies that some people are walking around without souls. And some Don, people, nearly everybody, and, uh, unfortunately. Don Juan talked about this as well, uh, that uh, there were people walking the streets that uh, were not alive. Um, perhaps you could share a little more about that. Uh, as to, uh, because there's different. certainly a large, okay, there may be something different, but there's certainly a large um, segment of the population who believes everyone has a soul, of course. You know, everyone has a soul. Yes, this is a popular myth, and naturally people like to believe this because they want to think that there's something which will go on after death and they'll end up in some sort of heaven or other. But this is simply a popular myth. These people are non-existent. They don't exist in themselves at all. They are puppets pulled about by invisible strings. Sometimes if you're in an altered state of consciousness, you see this, and it's very terrifying. You suddenly see that these people are not alive. It happened to me once on 42nd Street in New York City. Wow. You say in your book that uh uh, or in fact, I heard you say it personally uh, a few months ago in San Francisco to a group that um, one of the en enemies of a man of knowledge, referring to the Castaneda works, had gotten to you. I think you said it was the third enemy of the man of knowledge. What were you saying there about your own life at this point? Well, age, the last enemy of a man of knowledge, when the body begins to deteriorate, there's nothing much you can do about that. The body is programmed and will last for a certain period of time, about a hundred years at best, and it deteriorates. And you no longer have as much energy as you had. Can't be helped. How do you feel confronting the prospect of your own death at this point now? What, what is your... Doesn't you bother me in the least. Why should it? The thing is programmed, and at a certain point it's going to uh, fall apart for one reason or another. You're a biochemist, and I've heard others uh, play with the idea of cloning, uh, well, uh, it's called um, where the cells are regenerated, that if in fact we'd reached a higher stage of perhaps the fourth or fifth level, we wouldn't need to die physically, and that we could regenerate the cells that die. No, 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 there's nothing in that. Old cells don't regenerate. A good deal of nonsense has been uh, talked about cloning because people extrapolate from rather lowly organisms like newts and frogs up to human beings, which you can't do that. Like a, a, a lizard can regenerate its tail, but you can't regenerate your arm if it's chopped off. We don't have the power to regenerate our cells from one of us, one of our cells. There's only one cell, and that is the fertilized egg, which can regenerate an entire human being. And that human being is always different from the parents. There's not a code in the DNA that could be uh, reversed uh, regarding death, that if we got into that kind of control over our bodies, we could do that. I don't think anybody would bother who had that level of control. They say, what does it matter? They're probably only too uh, thankful to shed the thing. By that time, it's pretty old and infirm. They just drop it. Like an old coat, you don't go on wearing it when it's falling apart. You just shed it, get a new one. Have you reached that point now? Uh, do you feel that there's no further that you can proceed? Where are you on the path? Oh, if I told you where I was, you wouldn't know whether I was lying or speaking the truth. I can't tell you. Just form himself. But he doesn't do that very often. 
This was one of the problems with the Church of the Earth, that people got waylaid on the, the misuse or not non-use of their sexual energy. No, oh no, it was much more complicated than that. I was playing a game with another man who uh, was very much older in the work than I was, and he made certain fundamental mistakes. And his mistakes actually put me in a position like checkmate. I wasn't a good enough player to be able to take into account the fact that he had made those mistakes, yes, all right, so I have to play it differently. See, it's like a very, very difficult game of chess, played in four dimensions. And uh, I wasn't playing it on my own, you see. And his mistakes really uh, got me off balance. You said that one of the things that's uh, a problem in developing a community is the intellectual type uh, just can't seem to... Uh, uh, that's one of the great pitfalls. You said that in Master Game. Is that, do you see, as being where you... in some? Well, the, yes, the intellectuals want to sit around and talk all night. I had a whole bunch of them right in the very beginning at Berkeley uh, when I was starting this work, but they're no use to anybody. They have to get out of that talk trip and get down to practicalities. But it's unquestionably uh, uh, mainly a problem of neutralizing the negative emotions which develop among people in a group, neutralizing them in some way or other. And this calls for a, a, a teacher of enormous objectivity. He has to be really, really objective with people. He mustn't indulge in his personal likes and dislikes, his preferences and so forth. Evidently, Steve Gaskin has this power. He has, uh, Gaskin has definitely uh, limited uh, the kind of sexual activity that he finds uh, will work uh, to a monogamous situation. Do you... Uh, in your yes, he's gone back to the good old-fashioned monogamy because it's the only stable uh, sexual relationship which seems to work. I you know with the group with uh, me all tried experimenting around and group marriages and so forth, but it always had disastrous results. He just gets them together and says, listen, it's till death you do part and you better make it make it that way. Ram Dass is another one who's saying now that the um, sexual urge, the sexual path, uh, in no way can it be used to reach God. That uh, um, seems in contradiction, both of these, in some way, to your openness about, especially regarding the cerebratonic type. You say really should just have sex as much and as often as he needs to. How does that correlate? Do you agree with Ram Dass when he says sex can't be engaged in as a method or even? that it's really a block and a barrier to the awakening. Oh, that's not true. That's a bunch of... No, I can't agree with that. The sexual force can be used, and it's been known in tantric circles for centuries that it can be used. But how to use it is another matter altogether. Do you think that a lot of people in this culture particularly are not in touch with their sexual selves at all? As uh, Wilhelm Reich suggested, that very few people are really capable of having a complete orgasm, for example. Yes, because sex is in essence. The sex center works with uh, essence forces. And those are very powerful forces and very ancient. But in our culture, the persona keeps... Uh, poking its nose in and trying to get involved in the act, and spoils everything. So a lot of these sexual uh, misfits and misadventures are due to people who like each other in persona and aren't really um, suitable for each other at all in essence. And they get together and maybe even get married and have a kid or two. And then, of course, the persona trip s ceases to be interesting and they find out that they're not suited, and so they get divorced. It's a pathetic state of affairs. Can you describe how you harness the sexual thing for yourself and how you've used it? Do you feel that you've gotten the, uh, a hold of that whole thing? Oh, it's a very complicated trip. 
you have to understand that the body is not uh, the body as we know it is not the whole whole being. There's an aura which surrounds the body, and in the case of people who are actually developing, that aura can be very strong, very powerful. And the aura of the male and the aura of the female, if they're right for each other, can blend in a certain way and the result is a certain interchange of energies. He gets from her and she gets from him and they both enrich one another. So it's a source of very, very high energies actually. But this only happens if they're developing in the right way, if their auras are right. There definitely is such a thing as sexual yoga, but it's very difficult because we've been so wrongly conditioned about sex, we can't treat it just like any other function. For instance, the Devadasi in the temples of India, the old uh, temples, used sex quite definitely. They were trained to use sex. But uh, they've all been banished from modern India. I don't think you'll find any Devadasis left. Are you writing any more fiction? No, I wouldn't think of it. I only ever wrote one book that got published, one fiction book. It was your first book? Yeah. Pretty bad book too. Oh, I haven't been able to find it uh, except on no, your bookshelf. No, it didn't, here. didn't uh, get anywhere. And yet, that's such a, to me, a great way to develop and grow. Do you see any? Uh, <clears throat> that is a path: writing uh, uh, literature, writing fiction, writing stories about unfoldment. No, it's a very good way to get on the wrong track. <laughs> How so? Because you get involved in an imaginary world and you aren't, aren't here now. You get lost in a dream world. Occasionally, very occasionally, somebody like Hermann Hesse, who had very deep insights, can put the thing across in fiction, as in the bead game or as in the journey to the east. But that's rare. That's pretty rare. Well, I hope you guys will let me know when all this is going to come across on the air and we'll tune in our little radios and see what it sounds like. We will definitely let you know that. I don't think I've said anything I shouldn't have said.